Welcome everyone uh, to another series of our CPD in 43. Uh, today we have uh, Dieter from Autodesk, uh, the journey from design automation to generative design. Uh, should be a really good in-depth uh, look at uh, Autodesk, the AC package, and I'm probably particularly uh, Revit, um, which we mainly use um, as a tool um, to visualize and display our proposals um, in the built environment. Uh, so, as you can see, um, we'll basically start off with um, Dieter um, having the talk and then we'll have a Q&A session towards the end. So it'd be greatly appreciated if everyone could think of questions as we're going through, or even if you've already got some pre-prepared questions that you want to ask, uh, please do so and we'll field them to Dieter at the end. Um, just to highlight a future event. So the last event that we've got scheduled in for this year is um, with Hydrock Fire and Safety Design. Uh, so it'll be taking us through current guidance, legislation and common, common design issues. Uh, not one not to be missed. Um, it, it should be really interesting. Um, so uh, please do. It should be on the site Wessex Eventbrite page. Uh, we will post a link on the chat. So please do sign up for this and pass it to any of your colleagues that might be interested. Um, and then uh, CPD and 43 will continue in 2022. We're working on a schedule of events for that. Um, so please do keep your um, eyes peeled on our event by page and uh, our social media, as well as uh, e emails coming in from central office. Um, we are also considering a number of face to face events. So please do also consider to come along with it, coming along to those. That's it from me. So I'm going to hand straight over to Dieter. We're obviously going to go and hide in the background, but we are here. So please ask us any questions in the chat box and we'll reappear in the Q&A session. Yes. So hi, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks guys for having me in this uh, CPD. And the next 30 minutes, uh, or a little bit more maybe, uh, I'd like to take you all on something I call a journey, a journey from uh, design automation to generative design in uh, the AC industry. But before I take you on that journey, I'd like to talk you a little bit about how we look at evolution of design in, in uh, at Autodesk. So let's have a look on, on the way how we approach the building design industry, let's say. Now, traditionally, design is something that begins with a set of ideas uh, which are developed. And throughout the development process, designs are evaluated, they are improved, and we are adding constantly new design parameters or, or even constraints to create a new design iteration. Now, before we started using computers to help automate these kinds of things in, in smarter ways, designing was kind of like a game of battleship. You're blindly guessing on a spot and if you're doing any kind of simulation, that's the way how it goes. Or if you do like some analysis, uh, which is actually my background in structural engineering, you can wait for a hit or a miss answer to come back. That's the same thing we have in that game of battleship. A2, no, okay, then I'll put a white pin on it. Oh, A3 then, yes, that's a good shot. All right, then let's put a right pin on it. But you're constantly iterating through that process, you're constantly looking for, is this boat lying horizontally or vertically and so on. Now, by the time you get a hit, you're actually willing to settle for an acceptable solution instead of leveraging what we call a larger design space and getting closer to the optimal solution. So for instance, by having two specific pins know exactly what boat you are going to hit and what orientation it has. This kind of approach. Well, in that traditional way of delivering buildings, we also record it on paper. And this paper is then being used to deliver it to others who execute to build it. Now, again, we've been evolving as humans in that we are digitizing drawings. We, we make them more data rich and we make them easier to update. But the fact is that the expertise 
has actually not changed. That expertise is still something that is, it, that is inside of these guys, their head. So these professionals, they are the ones that have that expertise. And what we need is software to that helps us to capture what's inside of they, their heads. So if we combine the intelligence of those building professionals with algorithmic intelligence, then we think we can produce better buildings, right? At the same time, design projects still are becoming more and more complex. And this is causing us to rethink a little bit the way how we are able to make decisions. You know that research has shown that humans and machines working together can actually make better decisions and they can do it more quickly. And by using those machines to do the heavy analytics, this is something that frees up the architects to spend more time. More time on what? Well, more time on discussing the design options with the project team instead of having to do the iterative tasks and, and like doing redoing all the work constantly. Now, this is representing a paradigm shift in, in how we design. Rather than from sketch to completed construction, we can now work from a series of values and parameters to completed construction. And I always like to compare this with the design of a chair. In the traditional way of designing, we could think about the project challenge or the scope in a way like, I could phrase it like, let's design a chair. And if I would ask, ask all of you to do that, then you would grab a piece of paper and probably start designing the chair you're sitting on or the chair you can see somewhere in, in, in the area you're sitting in, or maybe even the one that is projected on the screen right now. So that means you're recording a thought, you're recording your decision on a piece of paper. And that's what traditional designing is doing. While in a contemporary way of thinking about designs, the project challenge or the scope it could be phrased as, let's design something to sit on. And then it's not that easy anymore. You cannot just grab a piece of paper and start drawing something because you will have different ideas and you need to find an idea that is suitable for sitting on it. So you're talking in terms of constraints and goals. You're describing actually the goals and you're describing the constraints for that specific chair. How strong does it has to be? How much weight can it support? What is the height of, our, of the back support maybe? What is the seating height? Do I need three or four uh, legs on that, on that chair? And so on. And therefore, generative design is something we see as a methodology, as a process, more than a single product or a tool. It's involving a focus on design optimization. And then for that, it's utilizing process automation. That's something we see as a solution for getting this contemporary uh, way of thinking uh, onto our designs to solve that at some point. But as I told you, it's critical, important to have that specific mindset on it. You need to think in that contemporary way. You need to rethink the way how we design. And it's important to for the companies in the AC industry to stay relevant in this increasingly competitive landscape we are all in. Um, by maybe developing tools which you have, skills which you have, but most importantly, that mindset. And that's the mindset around generative design. I want to give you a definition of generative design. It's very hard. We can go onto Wikipedia for it. We can Google on it. You will find multiple uh, ideas on how to define generative design. And at Autodesk, we like to define it as the text you can see on the screen in here, a form of artificial intelligence, which is dedicated to the creation of better outcomes for products, buildings, infrastructure, systems. So you can see it's something that can be used very broadly on lots of things, on, on lots of products, on architectural projects, on engineering projects, on construction projects, um, 
maybe even on the way how you want to organize your interior or the way how you want to put your plants into your garden. So all these kinds of things can be used uh, as specific cases in a generative design methodology. Now let's have a deeper look at that process. The process is not a game of battleship anymore. A generative design process is actually very structured and you start by defining a concept. You start by defining your constraints. And of course, most important, you start defining your goals. And that's actually where the people come in. That's where the building professionals, that expertise which is inside of our heads is used to build those three specific things. And then a computer is used to generate all kinds of options, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions if you like. And all of these options are getting evolved into better solutions because you generate an option, it gives you a result, the computer says like, hmm, well, this result is not something that we are aiming on. So let's move on, let's evolve it using algorithms. Algorithms that are actually mimicking uh, nature's evolutionary theory, which I will explain you a little bit more uh, later on in this presentation. And then again, it's the people, it's those BIM professionals that are taking all of these results, evaluate them, refine maybe the selection of those results, and then get a final solution, select it and integrate it into the BIM model. So as you can see, it's a more thoughtful way of approaching a design than playing that game of battleship, making a design, test it, tweak the design, test it again, tweak it again, test it again, and so on and so on, until you hopefully find something which is suitable for your customer. Now, actually to get into generative design, you need to follow like some kind of a design technology path, staircase. I didn't find the proper image yet that can tell us on how you can, or, or that at least has like a good metaphor on how you can move onto that journey. But journey is mainly something we can think about if we walk, if we drive. So let's take the stair for this because we are moving up in our skill set. We are moving up in the way how we approach things. So at the end of, of my story, at the end of this half hour, I would like, or I would hope at least that you guys know at which part of that staircase you are at this moment. So let's go through a few steps for that. And the first step of the stair is something I call traditional design. And traditional design is the way how we approach a design in our, well, traditional way, obviously. It's when we record a decision. Sketching is, for instance, one of the technologies, methods we use in this. So in the Middle Ages, they already had this technique, of course. So they used sketching to document the idea of creating a specific building. They even used parametric design actually already in it by adding those little crosses uh, in, in, in one of those buildings. So yeah, when they change that cross, the whole building changes with it. The difference with today is that back then they have to tear up the paper and then start over again. So we moved on and we digitized drawings in that traditional design by introducing CAT CAT helps us to automate the, the way how we draft. So the age-old drafting methods that, are, that is used to express design intent can be automated a little bit more now with computers. But it's about recording a decision. Now, I'm not going to focus on things like AutoCAD or on CAT's methods and so on. So we skip that part of traditional design and move on to the next a step on that stair. And the next step is what I call parametric design. And parametric design is actually an approach to those uh, traditional designs, but we are associating geometry with it. We are not just documenting it with, with lines that have no intelligence at all. No, we are actually using a computer a bit more passive uh, and we are taking like this expertise of that human with the power of a computer 
and we generate a design from it. A parametric design, a design which is driven by parameters and by constraints. So if I change something, the whole thing, the whole project works together and it changes with it. But still, it's a limited design because it's still a way of recording decisions. Um, we come up with a design ID and we test it, but we do this in an easy way. That's what Battleship, the game of Battleship, it's it's that mentality we get in this, in this way of working. But parametric design is, is, is better than just straight geometric modeling, right? Um, it, it's not getting us completely to where we need to go uh, when it comes to optimization, but still. Well, let's have a look at a few techniques in there. One of the techniques in parametric design is parametric modeling. Now, how can we define parametric modeling? I'd, def I'd like to define it with functions. Actually, in parametric modeling, we create implicit relationships that are built and maintained as you model. Change the route, and the entire system will move. So your geometries are based on those formulas. Now, with parametric designs, these assumptions uh, are there, so these inputs are there, and you get an output by applying that function. Now, if we have a look at a little example, then we can take this one. It, it's about a project in the city center, uh, somewhere in lower Manhattan, I think. Um, it's where we want to create a geometry on a specific site and um, yeah, on a given site we want to assign parametric constraints to it and then modify the parameters and document the ID. Now why should we do that? Well, in this conceptual tower mass project we need to take care of a few requirements. There are the requirements of the owner, the building owner. He want to have like a lot of rentable area uh, on that building. There is also the local authorities. They require some specific uh, rules for the height of that building to, yeah, because they want to keep, of course, the, 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 the skyline into some kind of an order. So, and you as an architect or as an engineer, you also need to find a few ways to, yeah, to get your building placed in there as optimal as possible, having like a bit of creative ideas to it. You want to take care of sustainability and so on and so on. So lots of goals, lots of requirements, lots of things that need to be tested. But hey, we have parametric constraints. So if I want to change a wall from level one to level two, then I just need to tweak the parameters in my Revit model and done. And I can automatically document the ID. So in here, you can play that game of battleship fast by changing a few inputs, you get an immediate result. You get a visual result or you get results in your schedules. So that helps. Now, a next technique, which is a level up within um, the tradition or within the parametric design step is what we call design automation. And the process within design automation is very simple, three steps. We gather a bunch of data, we run some calculations or maybe a script, it's not necessarily calculation, but you run something on it. So you process the data and you record the results from that data. So in this case, we take a few facade panels, which are parametric, we run some magic scripts on it, and then you get a facade with all kinds of irregular shapes, um, which are based on those uh, standardized data that we get from the facade panels. Now, how can we do that? Well, well there are way, a lot of things in there in our ecosystem that can help. So, one hand, we have Revit, and the ellipse is actually showing how powerful Revit can be, but how difficult it also is to use the tools. And so the more complexity you want into your model, the more difficult tools get. And that's not only for Revit, it's just typical in parametric design that this is happening. Now the Revit API is something that helps us to get more powerful tools, but it's still difficult to execute uh, these commands and to build those commands mainly. So that's why Dynamo came in uh, I think it, it's about uh, eight, nine years ago now, 
since it was presented for the first time at uh, Autodesk University in Vegas. But Dynamo is actually lowering the difficulty level to get powerful tools because it's easier accessible. And look at this example. For those among you that don't know about Dynamo yet, this is actually quite simple to understand. And, and let me help you a little bit. At the right-hand side, you can see a very simple example of how Dynamo is used to extract the volume of a selected model element from a Revit project. Very simple, 2.68, whatever unit you want to add to it. That's how Dynamo works. At the left-hand side, this is what the Revit API is doing. This is what the Revit API needs as input if you want to build a tool that gets the volume of a selected object. So, well, quite intensive if you want to, uh, if you need to program this, of course. But also, it's very versatile then, and it helps you to, yeah, well, you can step in in between every line in that Revit API. So that's easier uh, to to customize your ID. At the right-hand side, you're a bit fixed to the blocks that are delivered in your Dynamo environment or extended by other packages. Look back in our project um, where I wanted to place that tower, and I, I want to do this battleship exercise again on, um, on that tower. How can we use Dynamo to, or design automation at least in there? Well. Dynamo player in Revit is actually organizing all the Dynamo scripts that are used, that are built within the company. And then this, in this case here, the user who actually doesn't have any knowledge, he, he doesn't even, is, he's not even interested at least in Dynamo. He just wants to use a tool that builds a tower, that gives a, some numeric feedback on that specific tower so that he can check if it's meeting the customers and the local authorities' requirements, and then move on. That's his only interest. So that's what design automation is doing in here. It's automating that creation, and it gives us a bit of feedback at the same time. Now, if I want to change it, or if I want to uh, add a few more towers onto that given site, sure, go ahead. And this is actually helping us to speed up that game of battleship. So we move forward in being smarter and playing that game. So, yeah. Another example is, for instance, in structural engineering industry, where I want to uh, play steel connections. So in, in this case, we have like a very repetitive task of placing clip angles uh, for the secondary to the main uh, beams. Uh, if you have to do this manually, it takes a lot of time. And there exist a few tools that can copy or propagate uh, steel connections from one point to another. But in this case, I want to customize it. I want to have like my own definition of it. So again, in there, a specialist in that company creates a, a specific uh, script within Dynamo that can be used with Dynamo player and then be placed. And, and they are placing the clip angles wherever they want. And they can even reuse it for other projects. So actually the return on investment is quite big in here. Maybe it took them one week or maybe not, maybe even three or four working days to build that script. And then you could see within 60 seconds, the clip angles are placed. If you have to do this manually, it might easily take you a few minutes to do this. And yeah, well, if you have like thousand connections per project, that might count. Well, that was design automation, quite easy to understand, I think. The second thing is, or the, the third thing, at least within uh, the parametric design uh, method, is computational modeling. And this technique is actually a process that's a bit longer. It's also gathering data, but from that data, it generates a model which gets analyzed. And from those analysis results, we explore all the solutions and then integrate it into our model. So we are actually manually generating multiple options. Again, for our tower, that would mean that we get the boundaries from a Revit model. So we get the site conditions. We generate a geometry from it, which is designed or which is developed in this Dynamo script. And the third step, you are going to analyze the results. Like what is the facade area? What is the rentable floor area? Uh, how high is that building? 
what is the, the FAR ratio and so on. And then finally, we integrate it into our BIM model. But it's a manual process. And I'll show you this manual process in, an, in another example where we also want to evaluate in a conceptual way, at least, the way how we place light bulbs and onto a ceiling for a specific room. So in this case, I want to find a solution where we have like the least amount of unlit points and the least amount of overlit points. And the way how we do this is actually making a script that is analyzing the geometries, analyzing the surrounding areas in there like walls and other obstacles. And what do you need in here? Well, you need parameters at the front end that are tweaking the position of each of those uh, yellow um, balls you have in there. And those yellow elements, they are actually representing, of course, the points, uh, or at least light points. And in an output, I can count all kinds of things, count the number of light bulbs, count the number of unlit floor points, count the number of overlit floor points, and so on and so on. And so you can build your own analysis in there. It doesn't matter what you want, as long as you can express it with a number, as long as you can express it with a Boolean or a text parameter, then you have analysis results, which can be visualized by those colors, of course. But what is the, the result of this? If we look at the process, well, we have to drag that slider of that division in one direction, which is called U, and the division in the other direction, which is called V. I have to drag that slider manually every time until I find a solution where we don't see blue and where we don't see red. Well, I cannot see you thinking, but if we were all in, in a big room, then I could see you thinking, well, yeah, that's a game of battleship either. Exactly. You're only playing it faster. You're like immediately testing, is this a boat of five points horizontally? Yes or no? Instead of just throwing out a pin to the other side. That's actually what computational modeling is doing. You're designing with a result that is, that is returned immediately while designing. So that makes it faster for you to, to, to go forward with that kind of uh, project. So actually, with this point, on this step of the stair we are now, so to give you a little bit recap, we started with traditional design, sketching, and CAT were parts of it. Then I went to parametric design, where we had like parametric modeling, design automation, and this one here, computational modeling. Now, we are very close to taking the next step, which is generative design. Because the process in generative design is not that different from computational modeling. In here, the focus is on describing goals and constraints. And the way how we do it is by, well, combining our human expertise with computational power and using computational algorithms. And this thing will help us to generate hundreds, thousands of design options in actually the same time as you would need to only describe one in a traditional or parametrical design method. The process of it is a bit more complex, the, the, the technical process. We start with gathering data, generate a model from it, analyze it, rank the solutions, evolve the solutions, explore them, and then finally integrate it into our BIM model. Now, the way how that works is something I can explain you with this um, yeah, with this little story. It's a, it's a story about finding an ideal window for my building. And um, we start by generating different topologies for that specific window. And all of those windows need to be analyzed. And we have two fighting principles in here, which means that this is ideal for a generative design solution, having two fighting principles, because I want to have the best views to outside and secondly, I don't want to have too much sunlight into my building. Why is that? Well, yeah, if I want to have the best view to outside, then the obvious solution for a computer would be, let's just make a, a glazed wall. Let's skip the brick part. Let's skip the concrete part, just glass everywhere. And then you have like a glazed house. Well, I guess in summer we would all burn 
in this kind of house, not even talking about privacy. So we have a fighting principle in here. So a script, a generative design script, is analyzing each of those windows, analyzing the views to outside, analyzing the amount of glass or at least the amount of heat load we get into our building. And then we rank the solutions based on their numerics, based on their metrics. The blue one seems to be a good solution. Is it the best one? Well, it's the best of those five, but it's maybe not the best in its global environment, let's say. So that's where Evolve comes in. And Evolve is taking that one solution and is generating alternatives which are genetically very much the same. It's actually using genetic algorithms for that, which are mimicking nature's evolutionary theory to get to that point. And it ends up with five solutions, five solutions which are all meeting our requirements of having this minimum amount of use to outside, this maximum amount of solar uh, incidence on my glass. Now, which one should I choose? Well, that's where the human aspect comes in and where we as a human say like, okay, this one, the middle one, this is what I like. Aesthetically, that's, that, that's the one I like. It might be that one of you says that now the most left one, that's, that's way more beautiful. Or maybe you like uh, or these churchy type of windows at the right side. Why not? They fulfill the requirements of my generative design aspect. But yeah, it's up to us as, as the building professionals to define the aesthetics. And then in the final step, after the exploration phase, you integrate it into your model, into your BIM model. And this is the result. Very simple story. Now, if we apply this into reality, into building, or into in this in this case, it's into the construction industry, um, we have a project in here where uh, we want to find the best positions of two tower cranes uh, into a design model. And uh, for doing that, I'm not even going to use genetic algorithms. I'm going to use the generative design tools from Revit. Now in this video, it's still showing refinery, uh, but it's this, exactly the same principle. But we are going to use this method to actually um, randomize all the possible positions for those cranes. Let's say, let's randomize 100 positions on this gray, on this light gray site, and then use this path for the dark road. Um, to indicate what are the possible truck positions and then start generating. These are all kinds of options that I could not do manually. So this is actually let a robot play that game of battleship for me instead of me having to do it on my own. And if that robot has played that game of battleship, then I can choose my specific solution in there, which will be the best solution for playing that game of battleship just in one shot. That's what we are actually doing in here, if I want to use that metaphor of battleship again. So in here, we find a solution where we have the most percentage of liftable objects. So in this case, 97% of the building can be reached uh, by the current position of those two tower cranes and those two delivery points for the trucks. So it means that for a little bit less than 3%, we need a customized solution, or maybe we need to randomize it more, or maybe even go into a real optimization. Now, if we look at a um, generative design solution for tower mass creation, then in this case, we want, let's have a look at this building massing uh, tool. Now, as you see in here, we want to change a few of the sets, a few of the rule sets in here. Um, <clears throat> this is showing, by the way, the, the, the new interface uh, instead of refinery. This is showing the, re the generative design for Revit tool. And the idea of this one, of this example, is just to find a volume uh, in which I can generate a tower. And um, you might say, like, oh, well, that's not really creative, so I don't like this as an architect. Yeah, correct. This is not creative. Now, um, this is actually showing in which volume I can have, like, my maximum amount of creativity. As long as I limit myself into this volume, then all the requirements 
that I've put in here for my program and my retail percentage will be fulfilled. So that's actually what this exercise is doing. So if we take that information and go back to our conceptual tower mass in, in Manhattan, um, how could that work? Well, again, we have our site boundaries. So we, we take that information uh, into our dynamo environment by extracting some data, extracting some constraints, and we start defining a computational model by creating this kind of blue geometry, as you can see. And optimization with generative design will start creating our champion, which is then integrated in the Revit model. And it's quite easy actually to execute generative design. The difficult part is where you put your front end and that's where actually you create your Dynamo script. That Dynamo script has to be built by, yeah, well, let's say by a Dynamo expert in the company, but everyone else can use the generative design tools, which is actually using that analysis script to generate these kinds of things. So the interface is completely customized by that person who, gener who, who builds the Dynamo script. And uh, for this model, for this building, um, we come up with like a completely different ID as the one I showed in one of the first slides. Because the generative design script is not taking into account like your ideas that you have in your head because you're not describing, you're not recording a decision, you're not coming up with that share. You're coming up with something to sit on as a project challenge. And that's actually what you translate into your design in, into your script, into your dynamo script. You say, like, okay, let's design a building that is meeting a total area of this amount, which has like enough floor variance, which has like a maximum facade area where we have like maximum amount of floors, which we're where we have constraints for, for instance, the top, the top. The, the first 10 floors at least, they cannot exceed like 50 meters height or something like that and generate that on a given site. That's actually our project challenge we have in here. And then you come up with like a completely different result than what you would have in a traditional design because this one is meeting your goals. This one is taking care of your constraints that you have defined. Hi, DJ. Um, if we could just... Um... Uh, look to wrap it up and go into the Q and A yeah. session. Um, I have uh, only so one slide. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Great. Or, yeah. Or now, sorry, three, but I can do it in one slide. Um, I have another story in here, and I can. Sh yeah, you will find it into the into the PowerPoint. You, you will find the link where this story is talked about a bit more. So uh, I'll skip that one. Um, but if we go into a recap version of this progress, of this journey, then I told you about traditional design where we started recording decisions. We had parametric design where we associate geometry with it. And within that geometry, we can have parametric modeling as a technique. We can use design automation as a technique and computational modeling. And as you can see on the colors, it's gradually moving from green into blue. And this is not just to make the PowerPoint slide looking nice. No, th there is actually an, 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 a meaning behind that. The moment you are into computational modeling and you progress into it, that's the moment you can switch your mindset into generative design and where you can, where you have the skill at least to describe goals, to describe constraints and use the technology, use Dynamo and generative design and Revit to create those amazing generative design projects. So to end up, I hope that I mm. could give you a bit more insight of how that stair could look like for you. And I hopefully you found the step that you're on and which one you want to be at uh, and how to move forward. Now, later on, when you have that presentation deck, when you have the slide deck, you will find more links with resources uh, to learn about this technology, to learn about Dynamo, to learn about generative design, and to find a few more examples. So I'd like to thank you for your attention in here. Thanks for that, Dieter. Um, <clears throat> so now if we go into the Q&A session, um, 
we've had a question in from Liam. Um, he said he, he's a novice at Dynamo, but there's appetite within his practice to uh, look at his integration. Other than Dynamo BIM website, do you have any other resources that are available or could you highlight any sort of training, et cetera, that can be done? Um, well, that's that's something that is available in the um, in the slide deck. Uh, I actually had a slide on it, so I can put it on here. It's primer.dynamobim.org. Well, yeah, it is Dynamo BIM website, but that's that's actually the best one to get examples for uh, training. But there is also a lot of e-learning uh, available. Uh, Global e-learning is doing a lot of these things. Um, resellers are doing lots of trainings and um, I got all my inspiration actually from the AU online website from Autodesk University. There are a huge amount of Dynamo uh, presentations on there with lots of content that can help you learn. Okay, great. Um, and then also, um, we spoke about this earlier, but uh, there's been news that uh, Dynamo is being discontinued. Um, however, that's not completely accurate, is it? Um, so if you can go into sort of explaining that in yeah. further detail. Uh, Dynamo itself is not discontinued, but Dynamo Studio, which was a standalone version of Dynamo, uh, will be discontinued. Uh, because Dynamo itself is integrated in Alias Design, in Revit, Advanced Steel, Civil 3D, and Robot Structural Analysis. So that's actually uh, the the goal, or, or at least the, the, the long-term vision, so that it will be an integrated product in all these hero products. Okay, great. Um, and you, you also um, brought up, uh, for example, the lighting design. Um, uh, is there sort of YouTube links or where you've gone into sort of slightly tangential areas? Um, is it is it mainly primer Dino BIM that would be good for that to sort of explain that further? Or is there other sort of resources that sort of focus on specific areas? Um, I think the Autodesk University online library with the classes, uh, this one is actually the yeah standing out in, in in a resource for practical examples so when it comes to learning the products then the primer is best is it about learning about how to to get inspired by new ideas then the autodesk university online is uh, is the best one actually learning dynamo is like learning a language and you can learn language by speaking it but or by reading things and in dynamo it works best by reading scripts that others have built and th this helps you to understand how things work um, we've got a question in from karina uh could you please summarize the main difference between computational design and generative design yeah that's a good point well i try not to use computational design as a terminology i try to use computational modeling uh, which is actually the same um, and then you get the difference. This is what I just showed in, the, in that process. So in computational modeling, you're actually you're, you're creating a model where you get like some kind of results. It could be a visual feedback and you use visual scripting for it. In this case, Dynamo, you get results in metrics, visual results, booleans or text factors, whatever you want to use as an analysis result and you tweak your parameters manually. While in generative design, the genetic algorithms are changing your input parameters. Um, by it's the computer that is changing it for you to get into an optimal solution, to convert to that right solution faster than you would do if you have to do constantly guessing uh, with, your, uh, with your sliders or with your parameter changes. That, that's the shortest way of how I can explain. There is way longer explanation for this, um, but I hope this could help you, uh, Karina. Um, and then obviously our customary question on pricing of Autodesk um, uh, uh, packages. So that's from Chris. Any chance of a more competitive pricing structure across the Autodesk package when some rival packages are sometimes more cost effective, more so Revit slash CAD, Vectorworks, etc. Mm, yeah, well, now you're pinning me here. <laughs> so <laughs> you probably get it all the time, to be honest. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm not going on those prizes, actually. But, uh, yeah, there are other people within our company that uh, decide on that. So unfortunately, I cannot give you a, a right answer uh, on this. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that we, we look at it from a workflow point of view and not from a product point of view. So that's actually why we offer AC collections uh, and that we promote collections rather than, than those point products. Um, so if you look at it from a workflow perspective by integrating the solutions, integrating everything through your uh, workflow, that's, uh, yeah, that's a different approach then. So Chris, you're gonna have to um, maybe arm wrestle your reseller and uh, see if you can get a discount. Um, yeah, good point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we don't have any other questions, but is there anything that you sort of want to summarise before we sort of bring it to, bring it to a close? Um, I think yeah. Well, look at the last two slides in the power in the slide deck that will be shared. Uh, you will find lots of stuff to learn about and. Um, yeah, look at AU online. Look, if you Google my name uh, at AU or if search my name at AU, you will find lots of presentations. All my data sets uh, are available in there, way more than what I showed in here. So uh, this hopefully might help you or inspire you in, to move forward into that uh, journey yourself as well. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to quickly share our screen and go back to the main poster. So obviously, thank you to Dieter uh, from Autodesk, um, who was our CPD in 43 today. That was a journey from design automation to generative design. Hopefully you guys have got some really interesting uh, nuggets from that. Um, we will be making the uh, presentation available uh, via the email that goes out via Eventbrite. So if you've signed up on there, please do uh, look out for that. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we've got our final final uh, event, which is from Hydrock, which is our last in CPD three CPD in forty three series for this year. That's fire safety design, and we've asked them to sort of go on sort of quite a broad spectrum. So it's not so it's, it's it's obviously the fallout from Grenfell, the changes to planning, the changes to legislation, so current guidance and legislation and common design issues as well, which we've highlighted to them to have a have a sort of a brief talk about. It might slightly overrun, but uh, we have asked them to sort of look at quite a lot um, whilst doing that talk. But obviously, it's very pertinent for the time for for the time that we're in. Um, uh, and then obviously uh, we have 2022 to look forward to and um, we are currently developing an entire series of events for 2022. Um, some of those will also be face to face. So we look forward to seeing you all virtually um, at our upcoming events and also in person in due course. Um, thank you for everyone that is uh, that has attended today. Thank you again to Dieter um, and we'll bring that to a close.